Hello everyone! Before this video starts, I want to say a huge thank you for 5,000 subscribers. It's honestly crazy to me how far this small little channel of mine has come in the past 9 or so months. It really does mean the world to me, so genuinely thank you for that. Secondly, this video might be a little more serious than usual, and also is going to be spoiling basically all of the best parts of Persona 5 Royal. So I'd recommend going to actually play the game first before watching this video. So having gone on record multiple times saying that Dr. Maruki is my favourite boss of all time and gushing about how amazing his story is, it's kind of strange that even after all this time I've never gone into detail about why he's so amazing. And I plan to do that today. There's a lot of stuff I want to cover so I'm not going to waste any more time. This is your final spoiler warning. So, Maruki is one of the two new characters added in Persona 5 Royal, although technically it's three depending on how you view Akechi. And when I first saw him, I didn't really think anything of him. It was pretty obvious he was going to be story relevant though, being as he has such a heavy focus after Kamashida confesses his crimes. But even from the very first time he comes on screen, it's pretty obvious there's something about him that says he's got something to hide. I think the first reason why Maruki truly stands out to me and made such an impact on my first and basically every other playthrough was because he's genuinely just a nice person. He's a therapist who spends pretty much all of his time doing everything he can to help comfort the students of Shujin Academy. And it's clear through his confidant link that he's genuinely just trying to do his best to help everyone he comes across. There's never any hint that he has some kind of ulterior motive because he genuinely doesn't have one. Even after it's revealed that he's the ruler of essentially reality as a whole in the third semester. Everything he does is to further his goal of helping people, no matter how blind he may be to the fact that he's just making things worse. The ultimate goal is, at the end of the day, to make everyone happy and to let them live their perfect lives. It's clear that he's so selfless in his acts because everything he does, even something as simple as talking to Futaba and LeBlanc, is done with the interest of putting others first. Even in an entire game of people with different motivations and people hiding the truth about themselves from others, Maruki is the one person who puts his true goals front and centre and never once goes back on them. From the moment he's introduced, right up until the calling card is tossed on the table towards him, he stands true behind his goal of helping as many people as possible, be it through his research or through just simply talking to people. And we see this even more through his confidant link. Every interaction between him and Joker has something to do with learning how different types of pain affect people's consciousness, or how there's different ways to heal and how only you can truly know how much pain you're really in. And it's so impressive how smoothly things seem to go during this confidant link. Maruki almost always is able to discover some form of genuine help towards his research, unlike basically every other confidant link in the game that has multiple bumps along the way. Now, whether that's from him already being able to affect certain things in reality or not is really up for debate, but it's clear that the simple conversations he's having with Joker are more than enough to push his research forward. Most likely in thanks to Joker's experiences in the metaverse. I mean, Maruki himself even says Joker is the reason all of this is happening. But that's not all. Throughout the game, every single Phantom Thief member has some form of counselling with Maruki after they officially join the team, even characters that aren't students at Shujin like Futaba or Yusuke for example. With the exception of Morgana of course. And it's explained later on during the beginning of the third semester that even just talking to the other members of the Phantom Thieves and helping them through counselling was enough to help him actualise his reality. And when everything does come together, it's shown how he was able to use their wants and dreams as a way to warp reality in the first place. The game even points out that the Phantom Thieves themselves chose Maruki to take control after Yaldabaoth was defeated. And even though it was subconscious, it happened. And while everything seems perfect now with everyone's dreams being realised, you can begin to see where Maruki's flaws are. And what's perfect about this is that, well, he doesn't see what he's doing wrong. Maruki's reality supposedly has the Phantom Thieves and everyone else living their perfect lives, but in doing so, they've never had to endure any of the hardships presented to them throughout the game. And as such, they've never had to grow as people and improve on themselves. Ryuji never had to grow from his incident on the track team, Ahn never had to deal with Shiho's attempt to end her own life, Yusuke never had to deal with Madarame being a complete piece of shit, Makoto never had to endure all her feelings of worthlessness from her sister or the pressures from everyone around her, Futaba would never have to grow from the loss of losing her mother, 
Haru would still remain completely unimportant to the story, not a lot changes there honestly, and Akechi would never have to live the life he did. In the most basic, surface level view of this ideology, it sounds like a perfect life. But the game also shows that if this was the reality everyone lived in, not only would the Phantom Thieves never have existed, or at the very least not in the same way they did in the actual reality, but they'd all end up as completely different people. As a matter of fact, they technically would have never met each other as a group or become friends in the first place. Being as Joker is realistically the knot that ties them all together. And in this reality, as Akechi says, Joker was never falsely charged. Meaning he realistically shouldn't even be there. Meaning that every member of the Phantom Thieves would be completely changed in almost entirely negative ways. If you never have to experience any kind of hardship, or in Sumire's case, the pain of losing someone important to you, then you'd never be able to grow as a person. You'd be completely stagnant and you'd have no reason to improve yourself or experience anything because why would you? When everything's already perfect, there's no need to strive to be better. Maruki, through interacting with the Phantom Thieves during the main game, instead of helping them get over their traumatic instances, like he was supposed to do, has repressed them into shallow versions of themselves, where they never needed to grow because there was no negative experiences to grow from. He's essentially forced them into doing the same thing he ended up doing to himself. Through his own painful experiences, he decided to hide from his own pain and become stagnant, never growing from it and thus repressing into this mindset that you don't need to learn from the pain, you just need to never have experienced it in the first place. And replaying the game with this knowledge in mind, you can begin to see how while this initial view of him doing his best to help Joker, the Phantom Thieves and everyone else through their trauma, he's actually doing the complete opposite. It's clear from both his backstories in his palace as well as his interactions with Sumire that he already had the power to alter reality at least on some level way before he arrived at Shujin. And through his interactions with every important cast member, you can see him slowly beginning to find ways to quote unquote solve everyone's problems. Through his warped perception of reality, he's still helping people. And the most insane thing about all of it is, yeah, he is still helping people. This is why I love his character so much. He's written in such a way that even through his flaws and even with the knowledge of everything that happened to him and Rumi, and knowing that he's a completely broken man with basically nothing left without his research, you can still see into this morally grey zone whereby technicality he is still sort of in the right. It would have been better mentally for the Phantom Thieves to not have to go through everything they did. But at the same time, the fact that they went through it and came out stronger at the end is the exact kind of growth that Moriki needs to experience. Because having never experienced those traumatic events in the first place would have led them all to lead completely different lives and most likely become different and in certain cases, possibly worse people overall. Ryuji might have ended up like the assholes from the track team that he despises so much in the main game, or Ahn might have ended up like the bitch in her confidant link. But Moriki's unable to see that. The entire time he's on screen, he's still hiding from his own traumatic past, and has subconsciously convinced himself that pain itself should not exist. That no one should have to go through the pain of trauma, which is why he fights so hard to change Sumire. Again, everything in Maruki's arc can be viewed in two ways, and Sumire herself even says that the time she was under Maruki's influence did help her. But it's not a permanent solution. And this is where the game began to break me again, because I can honestly relate to this kind of thing. I've been through a lot in my life, and given the chance, would I go back and make it so that I never had to go through all that? That I never had to experience some of the most mentally taxing years of my life, while being completely unable to talk to anyone about it? On the surface, maybe. It seems like such an easy solution, being able to just prevent every bad thing in my life from happening, live the way I want to, and to be able to help the people I care about live like that too. It does sound like it would be the best way to live. But had I not gone through any of that, I wouldn't be where I am today, and where I am right now. After healing and growing, finding people who genuinely care about me, my own found family, in a very similar way to some of the Phantom Thief members as a matter of fact, I'd genuinely say that those bad parts of my life had to have happened. And in a weird way, I'm thankful they did, because those moments led me here. And it's the same for the Phantom Thieves and even non-Phantom Thief members like Sojiro or Hifumi for example. Every important character in the game is better by the end of their stories. Even someone like Akechi manages to improve in even the smallest possible way. And none of that would have happened had they never had to go through any of their traumatic experiences. And I honestly think Akechi is a perfect example of this. 
Throughout most of the game, Akechi is shown to be sort of a foil to Joker, being basically his total opposite in almost every way. And when Royal first came out, I heard a lot of people saying that Akechi felt kind of sidelined during the third semester. I really don't think that's the case though. Akechi's role in the third semester changes drastically. It's no longer about him being Joker's foil. Really, he actually sort of becomes the foil to Maruki himself. Being as it's not Joker who pushes the team to go back to the original reality, it's not Joker who fights without questioning anything that's going on, it's not Joker who never stops for a second to think that this life is better, it's Akechi. He was handed the perfect reality on a silver platter, brought back to life by the wish of his greatest rival and potentially lover, and not only absolved of all of his crimes, but never even committed them in the first place. And he smacks that offer right back in Maruki's face. Akechi, unlike all of the others, sees right through Maruki's bullshit. He knows fully that Maruki isn't trying to make a reality where everyone lives a perfect life, he's trying to make a reality where everyone lives a perfect lie. He might not have the full picture at the beginning of all this, but he's more than smart enough to know that what he's doing isn't the right way to go about things. And he might never actually say it out loud, but he's fully aware and accepted the fact that he shouldn't be alive right now. Akechi fully accepts the fact that he'd rather die, having grown from the person he was at the beginning of the game, than have the perfect life handed to him on a silver platter. And through every single interaction with Maruki, he rejects the offer time and time again for things to be improved, for him to have a life free of pain, because while he says that he refuses to let his life be puppeteered by someone else, it's pretty clear that he knows this life would be one where it'd be impossible for him to be able to live with the knowledge that someone forced him to repress all of his emotions towards Shido, and all of his plans to take revenge. And seeing all this shows how he's just this perfect opposition to Maruki. But on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, there's Sumire. And I don't think I've ever related more to a character in any piece of media. Akechi might be my favourite playable character, and Maruki might be my favourite character overall, but Sumire is by far the one I relate to the most. Everything about Sumire's arc is perfectly tied into the things I've already talked about. She's the perfect example of Maruki's ideals being completely flawed to their core despite on the surface being positive outcomes. Sumire, or Kasumi as she's called throughout the entirety of the game before the third semester, is living her big sister's life thanks to Maruki changing her cognition in order to keep her from dealing with the survivor's guilt. But in doing so, he's technically made every aspect of her life as Sumire worse overall. It's shown through Sumire's confidant links, once you've actually unlocked the second half of them, that Sumire spent her entire life living in Kasumi's shadow, and thanks to Maruki, it was now impossible for her to be her own person. And you might be wondering, if Maruki could bring back people like Wakaba or Okumura with basically no effort, why didn't he just bring back Kasumi? And the reason is that that wouldn't have solved the problem either. Sumire basically just copied Kasumi throughout her entire life, and desperately tried to get out of her shadow. Her entire arc is about her moving on from treating herself like she's damned for accidentally killing her sister, and learning to cope with the survivor's guilt. Bringing Kasumi back honestly may have made the problem worse, being as this would just put Sumire right back where she started. And if she were ever to actually remember what happened in the real reality, it would probably cause relapses far worse than what's actually shown in the game. Maruki wants to create a reality where Sumire can live as Kasumi without being threatened by those past events. And he says that's what Sumire wants, but it's obvious that he's blinded by his own desire to help, and he's pushing his own ideology onto her because he believes remembering the event in the first place is too painful for Sumire. So because he gave her the option to live Kasumi's life in the first place, she just says that she wants to do that because he presents it as the simplest option to avoid her pain. When in reality, it's shown as she grows into her own person through spending time with Joker and the other Phantom Thieves, it's clear that she's eventually able to accept everything and slowly realise who she is as a person. What's perfect about this is that it's shown she's finally accepted everything through her Showtime attack with Joker. Having her and Kasumi together, empowering each other and showing how Sumire is not only fully accepted who she is, but also has accepted that she's going to live her own life in her own way, the way that would truly make her sister proud. It's honestly quite terrifying replaying the game with this knowledge and seeing how all the breadcrumbs left throughout the main story were placed in such a way that they were barely subtle enough to hint at something going on when you replay the game, but also simplistic enough that someone on a first playthrough with no knowledge of this wouldn't possibly be able to figure it out. First off, no one outside of the Phantom Thieves calls her by her actual name. They only refer to her as Yoshizawa. And the only reason the Phantom Thieves call her Kasumi is that's just what her student ID says. 
The same thing with her phone too. Realistically, it was probably completely fine the whole time, but she subconsciously thought it was broken because her cognition was making her block out any time someone who knew she was Sumire call her by her real name. Honestly, even after playing this game well over 40 times, I didn't notice this until one of my friends pointed it out to me. But it all makes so much sense. The hints were there the entire time, and they're so well placed that even as big of a Persona fan as I am, I genuinely would have never figured that out. I know all of this might sound like side tangent stuff to some of you, but I don't think I could possibly talk about how amazing Moriki is without showing how he affected the other two most important characters in the third semester. And what's funny to me is that people mention the royal trio quite frequently, generally referring to Joker, Sumire, and Akechi. But as a matter of fact, the royal trio could also apply to Maruki, Sumire, and Akechi, being as all three of them are tied together in one way or another via Maruki's ideology, with Sumire initially accepting it and then growing as her own person, and Akechi rejecting it from the start and standing his ground in order to keep his growth as a person. And honestly, seeing Maruki's ideology put forward in full swing across his palace is one of the most gut-wrenching things in this game. I'd argue a lot of the palaces in P5 do represent the desires of their rulers decently well, though some are significantly more surface level than others. Maruki's, on the other hand, might be the single most deep and interesting palace of all of them by a wide margin. Unlike pretty much all the other palaces that generally follow one kind of theme, Maruki's feels so… disjointed in the best possible way. Every area of his palace is wildly disconnected from another, with each area only really connecting to the final one, rather than flowing from one area to the next like the other palaces do. And while I might argue for those other palaces this would be genuinely disorienting, here it actually works perfectly. It shows how desperate Maruki is to find a way to achieve permanent happiness for everyone, quite literally throwing every method he has at the wall and hoping that they work for people. And again, going through each of these areas, you can see how he's trying to find the perfect way to keep everyone from having to experience not just trauma-related pain, but pain as a concept. Close to the beginning of the palace, it's shown that he's completely taken over mementos. And as Lavenza says, he's slowly attempting to re-merge the public consciousness with reality itself. And he's doing it by slowly actualizing people's desires, giving them their perfect lives and using mementos as a means to do it, finding people with distorted desires and then using them as a means to remove their pain entirely. And with each person he does this to, he's slowly beginning to turn his false reality into the real one, completely controlling everyone and everything, removing the concept of pain entirely and forcing everyone to regress their own trauma, or even never having to experience it in the first place. Then as you progress, you come across the testing room, which has you answering questions based on how Maruki perceives the best answers, like giving up on something you really aspire to achieve just because it doesn't seem like it's working out, for example. Showing that Maruki's ideology values the lack of hardship as opposed to the happiness and fulfillment you get by pursuing through the tough times and actually achieving your goals. Literally, the answer Moriki has deemed best in the very first question of the quiz is prioritizing your own safety over the potential risks of helping a friend in need. Nothing else matters to him so long as you're able to avoid pain as a concept. And his strong distorted belief that everything is this black and white spectrum, where there are only two outcomes. Pain is bad, no pain is good. No matter what, this is what he enforces onto everyone because he believes the fallacy of not being in pain and being happy are the same thing. If you aren't doing bad, then you must be doing good. And then the further you go into the palace, you end up reaching areas where you begin to see how Moriki began to repress his own trauma about losing his girlfriend Rumi, erasing her own traumatic experiences and for all intents and purposes curing her of her emotional turmoil, but at the cost of never having met him in the first place, and her essentially being someone he's never met before. And it's honestly gut-wrenching to see him not only have to lose someone he cared about so dearly, but also to be put down time and time and time again until he finally awakens to his persona and is able to just take that little bit of control back. But by the time this happens, it's technically already too late. He's already began repressing things, he's already pushed Sumire to do the same. He's basically just locked his true feelings away to avoid having to deal with the pain. And now thanks to his distorted desire to help everyone, it comes full circle, and shows that in order for reality to be reset, it's Maruki who has to accept reality and be able to move on from his own pain. This is demonstrated nowhere better than in the final, albeit short area in Maruki's palace, essentially just being the Garden of Eden. 
This perfect lie of a paradise where everyone whose realities have been actualized by Maruki end up after their quite literal brainwashing. And you'll notice that even though there are a fair number of people in this area, it's noticeably barren. Sort of implying that Maruki is now the one and only judge of who is living their perfect life according to him. If how you live life, even after everything that's happened in this palace, isn't exactly how he deems a pain-free life to be, you don't get to be in this paradise with the others. And every single aspect of this palace pushes this idea forward. Even the music. Gentle Madman and Out of Kindness are two of the most smartly named songs in the entire game. Especially Out of Kindness. Being as it's the double entendre of Maruki still being convinced he's doing everything that he's done up to this point out of his own kindness, but he's also literally out of kindness for the Phantom Thieves for not accepting his quote-unquote help. A lot of the palace themes are aptly named like this, but these two as well as Throw Away Your Mask during the boss fight are the single most important pieces of music in the entire game if you were to ask me. Especially Throw Away Your Mask. The entire boss fight and everything leading up to it always manages to break me down into tears. Seeing Maruki finally reveal his persona and changing the reality of the fight itself in his first act of force in the entire game brings me to tears every single time. Even though he keeps his composure for the first three phases of the fight, you can still see how desperate he is. How he seems to be completely unable to understand how the Phantom Thieves are happier living their lives through all the pain rather than repressing everything. And how he is giving it everything he's got to convince them that it's better in his reality. But as the fight goes on, you can see his utter desperation devolve into something significantly worse. And it just spirals out of control into a much more threatening situation right up until the very end. Maruki finally letting his emotions out. He truly did give up everything. He sacrificed everything he had and still ended up coming out of it in more pain than arguably any other character in the game. And now it's all bubbling to the surface. This, this is where the game truly destroyed me emotionally. I've been in this exact situation multiple times, having those raw, painful emotions bottled up for so long, trying desperately to be able to ignore them or pretend to be okay. It doesn't work. Things ended up being seriously bad for me for an incredibly long time, and it wasn't until I witnessed this scene for the first time that I finally realized how bad things had truly gotten for me. This one phase of the fight took me a solid two hours, simply because I was barely mentally holding on at this point. Seeing something I'd ignored in my own mind for the longest time portrayed to me in such a serious way in a game that I'd already decided was my favorite of all time. It sounds stupid, but it almost felt like this one scene was speaking directly to me. I broke down crying after this boss fight ended, and I still break down into tears whenever I replay it. Hell, reading this script and remembering everything that happens in the game is making me cry right now. It reminds me that even after everything that happened to me, I fought through it all. I grew stronger, I became a better person, and it shows that you can too. It is without a doubt the single most gut-wrenching scene in any game ever for me. It's more emotional than the ending of Amori, more impactful to me personally than the reconciliation battle in Everhood. Hell, this third semester actually changed my life, and genuinely prevented me from just ending things early if you know what I mean. I'm so happy that I got to experience this part of the game, and see everything that happened to Maruki and how even after everything, he ends up moving on, and he ends up happy too. It spoke to me in a way that's impossible to put into words. I've been trying to write the ending to this video for the better part of an hour now, and I genuinely can't say anything else. Everything about Maruki, his palace, this semester, his relationships with Joker, Akechi, and Sumire, all of it genuinely saved my life. And it might be kind of stupid to say that, but it's true. Seeing all the pain Maruki went through, seeing how his desperate attempts to rid the world of pain were a way to hide from his own, there's more raw emotion put into this one character in his arc than I've ever seen from any other character in any piece of media. And even though there have been many experiences that have changed my life for the better over the past few years, nothing will ever compare to how broken I was when I first finished Persona 5 Royal and how experiencing it the way that I did helped me keep going and helped me improve as a person. I genuinely don't think I could say any more if I wanted to. Dr. Takato Maruki is, and always will be, my favorite character in any piece of media. If you've stuck it out this long on a much more serious topic, I want to extend a personal thank you to you. I'll be back to much less serious videos next week, but it really means the world to me that I was finally able to sit down and put all of my thoughts about this topic into a video. With that said, if you enjoyed this one, please like, comment, and subscribe, join the Discord server, and until next time, 
Stay safe, everyone. Peace.